treating a patient who does require ACL surgery in the first place. So definitely clinical diagnosis. We had a very nice live demonstration session in which you had a good clinical exam as to how do you examine and decide whether this patient of ACL lacks knee requires surgical treatment or not. We're going to have another fantastic talk from one of the pioneers of musculoskeletal radiology right after this. And uh, Dr. Mrs. Patil will be discussing with us as to how do we image the ACL properly. I'll largely focus on what choice of technique one should use, what should be the surgical setup. We had um, a very nice lecture by Dr. Abhay on how he sets up his surgical uh, team. I almost always follow the same one. And what are the various surgical steps? I'd like to just enumerate them, not discuss them in details, because hopefully when we get to the live demo, we could spend a lot of time on showing them rather than talking about them now. And rehabilitation, we leave that out for the time being because that becomes you know half a day session in itself. So how do I decide what technique I should do? And just a few pointers. I definitely want to know the pre-operative activity profile of my patient. Is he a sedentary worker? Is he a sportsman? What sport does he play? Uh, what are his needs? Is she a housewife? What sort of uh, involvement does he have? What sort of commitment does he have to exercise? Are there any occupational issues? Is there any sort of religious aspect that is involved because you need to respect um, you know, all the demands that the patient has got? And how important is he, uh, is cosmesis? Because uh, if you're treating someone who is very, um, if I can say, very uh, conscious about cosmesis, then putting a scar in front of the knee to harvest a BTV graft may not be such a good idea. And last but not the least, uh, you will have about 5 to 10% of your patients who do, you will see in your clinical practice who have had an opposite side ACL tear and who have had an ACL reconstruction done on the opposite side. And you need to ask them what sort of graft they had on their opposite side and whether they are satisfied with the same. If I am satisfied with a hamstring graft on my opposite side, then obviously when I'm doing the con uh, contralateral side, I would want to choose the same graft because the patient does have certain preconceived notions and expectations and you need to respect them completely. Also, what is important to understand when I plan my surgery is what does the patient want to return back to? What does he want to do? Does he want to go back to sport? If so, at what level? Does he want to kneel down? If he wants to kneel down, I'm going to think twice as to whether I want to do a BTB graft. And again, cosmesis as what we spoke of. And also what is very important is what is my practice pattern like? Do I have the skill sets for various graft harvest? Do I have the specialized instrumentation that is required? Because if uh, one wants to do a quadriceps tendon graft, as what Dr. Bamre did mention in his talk, then you do require a certain you know, set of specialized instruments. And of course, we are looking at different practice scenarios where we have to look at other issues besides the patient. We have to look at cost, affordability, and all those unfortunately have also, you know, they play a big part in the way we do our ACL surgery. Last but not the least, as what you saw in the previous patient, which had come up for clinical exam, are there any associated injuries? Because then you may need to plan about simultaneous other ligament reconstruction. So as a first part of what technique, how do I decide which graph do I use? I decide by measuring the footprint of that patient's native ACL. And if I have the native footprint, which is less than 16, then I would prefer to do a hamstrings graft, either a five or a six strand hamstrings. We've uh, measured the footprint of uh, today's patient. It's around 16 millimeters. So our plan will be to do a five string hamstring for today's live demo. But if we have long and wide footprints, which are in excess of 16 millimeters, then I am better off not using a hamstrings graft, but using either a BTB graft or a quad tendon graft, because you need to cover a large area of the footprint when you do your ACL surgery. So long, wide attachment sites, I think you need to look at larger graft sources. What is important to also understand when you choose your graft is when will your graft heal, because that carries important repercussions on the rehabilitation that you will do. What sort of surgical setup do you want? And here, I think I would make a very bold statement by saying that you need to have 
the best when you're doing these type of surgical procedures. The reason being is that arthroscopy is a technology dependent uh, surgical technique. And if you don't have the best, then I don't think we can give our patients the best. So though initially it might come as a very big investment, but I can vouch for all of what I'm saying right now is that if you invest in your equipment and you buy good quality equipment, you will definitely have relative ease of surgical procedures and you will be able to do a better and a good job. So as Dr. Abhay did allude that a side post, a fixation post or a leg holder are good options, but I prefer to use a side post as Abhay has taught me how to do it. So I exactly do what he tells me to do. Surgical skide prep is very important. So, you know, the first step would always start by scrubbing the foot, then scrubbing the knee. Then you want to definitely prepare the whole limb. You want to then go ahead and isolate the surgical area. These are things probably which will not get discussed too much in our regular meetings. But when we're talking about step by step, I feel that this is a very important step that we should not fail to sort of you know talk about you need to use impervious drapes that seal off the operated limb from the rest of the body because you don't want any contamination to occur and then you need to have all your instruments laid out on a proper trolley properly sterile with the help of plasma or such good sterilization technique i would strongly discourage to use any form of formalin chambers because they are things of the past even 2% glutaraldehyde or Cydex as we call it has shown to have its drawbacks or its negative effects. So I think in the best interest of our patients, we need to use either LTSF or we need to use plasma autoclaving so that we can have um, you know, the best inner sepsis. Essentially, you need to completely seal off the surgical area so that when we do our surgical technique, you would look at the patient's leg being placed on your thigh and you need to maneuver the leg to various positions. And in all of these, sterile and strict asepsis is going to be completely important, which is what we need to look into and which we need to sort out. And we need to think about all these things way ahead of times. So portals, and we discussed them, but um, I uh, ask your permission to sort of discuss them all over again. For doing ACL surgery, I'm going to use three portals. I will use the anterolateral portal, which um, as Abhay has explained, has to be high because you want to look down. This will be your predominant viewing portal. You will have the anteromedial portal, which is going to be your viewing and your working portal. And I will have a third portal, which is the accessory anteromedial portal, which will be my working portal predominantly. So how do I make my anteromedial portal? Of course, you make it outside in by using a simple 18 gauge needle. If you place it too low, it's going to cause crowding of instruments. So that's why you need to place it high and medial as possible, flush to the medial border of the patellar tendon. The same holds true about the accessory anteromedial portal. If you keep it high, again, it leads to crowding of instruments. So you need to have it low and medial as possible so that you can maneuver your instruments with good ease and will not cause any problems while you're doing surgical uh, procedures. What is important to look at is that the view drastically changes. This is how you would look at it with an anterolateral portal. You will see the PCL and the ACL. The moment you look at it through the anteromedial portal, now you can see, you, you can have a good view of the complete facial femoral footprint. And when you maneuver this view and when you start switching these viewing portals, you'll be able to appreciate anatomy a lot more better. What is again important is where you place your anteromedial portal. The more lateral you place it, the longer femoral tunnel you will get. The more medial you place it, the shorter femoral tunnel you will get. So that becomes another trade-off. If you want to make very long femoral tunnels, you have to be close to the patellar tendon, but then that leads to crowding of instruments, which you don't want. You usually desire a femoral tunnel, which is approximately 35 to 40 millimeters in length. And this can very easily be achieved when you place your anteromedial portal low and medial, and that should be a very good 
position to place the same. So this is how it will look if you place it more close towards the patellar tendon, you will get a longer and a circular type of a tunnel. If you place it more medial, you will get slightly more less in length and you will end up getting an oval type of a femoral tunnel because you're not drilling exactly perpendicular to the lateral femoral condyle, you're drilling obliquely, which is why you get a slightly elliptical tunnel, which you need to keep into consideration. You need to hyperflex the knee to more than 120 degrees when you're drilling your femoral tunnel. But here, there is absolutely no compromise of viewing, and I will show that when we go ahead. So this is how you would look at the ACL footprint at 90 degrees. And we all feel that if I hyperflex, I will not see the ACL footprint properly. But this is again another view at 120 degrees. You actually start seeing it a lot more better. So the first step that all of us should start doing in our next case is that don't view the ACL femoral footprint from the anterolateral portal alone. Start using the anteromedial portal <clears throat> for viewing and you will find that you will be much better off in performing your surgical technique. So this is a quick video as to how we would be doing a single bundle ACL reconstruction. That's the torn ACL. You would first get in your shaver and clean up the stump. You want to expose the anatomy. You want to bring in a needle which reaches the femoral footprint or the femoral stump. Make a portal in the same way that Abhay has spoken about. And then you start working on the femoral tunnel. I like to use a radio frequency device to mark out the stump if at all there is any. If there is no stump present, then that you have to then rely on other landmarks. But it's always a good idea to try and feel and palpate if there is any stump and go right behind the joint to see for the complete extent of the stump. I usually like to use a ruler in a lot of cases to try and measure the footprint so that then I can decide where I want to place my femoral tunnel. Femoral tunnel malposition is the most leading cause of failure of ACL reconstruction. So please don't be afraid to spend time to make your femoral tunnel and always try and view the femoral footprint while making this from the anteromedial portal. It makes a lot of difference and it helps a lot to try and achieve a perfect position. Then with your guide pin, you can manipulate the guide pin such so that you can get the desired length of the femoral tunnel. You want to drill with the knee in hyperflexion. You are getting an extremely good view. You can use a small tissue protector if you need at this stage. And once you've done that, Depending upon what system you're using, you need to over drill for the hamstrings and then do a definitive drilling with the same size diameter as that of the graft that you've prepared. Once you've done that, you want to remove any debris. If at all there is size or measure the length of your tunnel and then go ahead and park your passing suture in. On the tibial side, You'd want to use any of the available, commercially available guides which are there. You want to pass your pin. We'd like to place the tibial tunnel medial two fifth and uh, lateral three fifth. And when you're drilling the tibial tunnel, we always enlarge it by serial drilling and serial rimming because we don't want to destroy the cartilage which is present on the tibial plateau. This is how your tunnels would look. And after you've passed your graft, which has been duly marked, you'll find that it fits to the contours of your native footprint very nicely. And then it allows you to have a good outcome. So this is exactly, I mean, in very short, maybe about three, three and a half minutes as to how your ACL reconstruction, I would do step by step. Following that, I definitely want to cycle my knee from zero to 90 for about 20 cycles. You can use a tensioning device or you can use your own hands to cycle it. And the reason why you need to cycle the graft is because you want to take out any possible creep in the collagen fibers. And then we go ahead and fix the tibial side with the help of an interference screw. 
the angle of fixation on the tibial side is usually about 20 degrees of flexion but in patients who have hyperextension more than 10 to 15 degrees i would like to fix it at about full extension because it then allows less capture of the graft which is very important how would you fix the tibia again flex it to about 20 degrees pass your pin and then keeping tension on your graft with a posteriorly directed posterior draw force you one would go ahead and fix the tibia with the appropriate sized screw a lot many times you know there is always this question that i get asked is what size screw one should use and i think the instrument that i rely upon the most is my screwdriver so after i've passed my graft use your screwdriver and try and pass it in the tunnel beside the graft and this is i think in short what i have come to a conclusion about if i'm using a soft tissue graft and the screwdriver passes snugly and the bone strength is good i will go up by 1 mm so if my tunnel diameter is 10 i'll use 11 screw if there is soft bone or if the screwdriver passes very easily then i'll go up 2 mm than what the tunnel diameter is if i'm not able to pass the screwdriver and it is going with great difficulty that my that means my graft is really very tightly snug then i'll probably use the same size diameter screw as what the tunnel is if i'm using a bone plug such as a btb or a quad tendon on the femoral side never use biodegradable screws always metal screws and i would use a 7 mm screw if there is soft bone i'll always use an 8 on the tibial side i would always use a metal screw which is 8 or if there is soft bone then i'll probably use one size less than what diameter i've drilled which means if i've drilled a 10 then i'll use a 9 and that's what i have sort of you know come to in my couple of days of um, couple of years of practice so i think to conclude what is important is that when we look at step by step i like to choose my graft as per patient's requirement and as per the patient's condition i need to have a minimum graft diameter of at least 8 to 8.5 nothing less than 8.5 should be accepted because the re-rupture rate is exponentially high if your graft is smaller than 8 ideally you should cover at least 80 percent of the footprint with the graft that you've made use always a three portal technique it becomes a bit difficult and you may end up compromising the tunnel positions if you use a two portal technique view the femoral footprint through the anteromedial portal because femoral tunnel malposition is responsible for 42 percent of all acl reconstruction failures do a transportal femoral drilling or an outside in drilling that is very important because then you can reach to the anatomical sites properly fix the tibia somewhere around 20 degrees of knee flexion after cycling the graft at least 20 times because that allows for all the creep to go out and then of course if you're looking at an isolated acl reconstruction which you've done using all the techniques that we've discussed then definitely you can put your patient on an accelerated rehab to get the best possible outcome thank you all very much and thank you so much